All right, good evening. My name is uh, Dave Ferrante. Hi, Dave. Steve, how are you, my friend? I'm the uh, owner of Visible Voice Books, and I want to say that I'm honored to participating myself and the store to be honoring Raymond DeCapity along with his son Michael. Um, just so everybody knows, if you're interested in buying any of the books, they are outside over there around the corner across from the bar. Um, my job here tonight is very simple. I have the honor of introducing Dennis Dooley, who is going to be introducing Michael. Uh, I'll give you a little history on Dennis. Dennis is an author, former public radio broadcaster, and journalist, and winner of the 1986 Cleveland Arts Prize in Literature for his illuminating look at the work of mystery writer Dashiell Hammett. At Cleveland Mag as Cleveland Magazine's first arts editor in the 70s, he got the magazine to publish an entire novel, Raymond D. Capity's Pat the Lion on the Head, and co-founded the Cleveland Critics Circle, which recognized a young actor named Tom Hanks. His original piece of investigative reporting that uncovered the story of the creation of Superman by two Glenville High School students in the 30s led to Dooley's second book, Superman at 50, The Persistence of a Legend, which became a major and acknowledged source of Time Magazine's June 1988 cover story on that American icon. In the course of his five years with public radio, he won 20 national and regional awards. His work can be found, and his profiles can be found, more than 90 of them, and Cleveland authors, artists, composers, architects, and choreographers can be found at clevelandartprize.org. Dennis Dooley. All right. Thank you. Dave. Thank you. Visible. You're welcome. Visible voice. That is a great story. Boy, Thanks. You haven't been over there. That's a super good show. I'm going to over on the other side of town in North Collin. I'm going to head down here. It's oh, such a long drive. Me too. <laughs> Whereabouts? I grew up with you. Oh, we're on Overland Park. On 56 Cool. Cool. I was just there last weekend. It <laughs> <laughs> was, uh, yeah, we're just with cheese. <laughs> Anyway, I'm really honored to have a chance to talk about Ray uh, DeCapity. Um, he's a great friend for like 35 years, I guess. In fact, it was the guy who owns, uh, who used to own Civilization, the book, the uh, coffee house. He used to be on the Craving. corner there. Well, it was great. Bob Holsepp came into Cleveland Magazine years ago. I had just started out there, and he said, you know, I ran into this writer the other day, and I think you really like him. You, you got to meet this guy. You know, so he introduced me, and I just loved him, loved his stuff, everything about him. And ever, ever thereafter, we we come down to Sokolowski's all the time, but we'd sit at the bar, and we'd come in. They when they had this little tiny bar over in one corner behind the, where the cash register is now. It was a real little corner, little bar. It only sat about six people. And we'd come in there for lunch, and there'd be the sign that said reserved, you know. <laughs> Geez, Bernie, uh, say to Bernie Sobosky, it's reserved, is it? And he said, yeah, it's reserved for you guys. <laughs> we put the sign away, and we'd sit down, you know. We wiled away many a rainy afternoon there, let me tell you. A lot of great stories were told. I did an interview with him live once for uh, public radio. Right there on the oh uh, city at the bar, as a matter of fact, they were serving us clinking glasses. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of great ambient sounds. <laughs> and, and once Ray took me, there was a there's a guy in one of the books who plays the harmonica, right? He said, "Oh, that was based on this guy I knew. He was he played a harmonica in the neighborhood when he was uh, when he was young, and uh, he used to take care of his grandfather. And, and his grandfather was was very stubborn. He'd sit there and and uh, make the kid feed him, you know, a spoon. And the boy would become uh, distracted sometimes when he'd be out with the spoon. So the grandfather had this newspaper or something, he'd go, bam, and hit him in the head, you know. And he'd blow, blow. So they called this guy Stonad, 
<laughs> stung one. Right? He said he, he always kind of went around a little bit. Anyway, he said, you want to you want to meet this guy? He said, you know, he's he's living in a in a retirement a nursing home, like you know, whatever. It's way the heck down down the river, um, mile or so. So we got in the yeah, yeah, sure. We paid up, got in the car, drove down there. I brought in the microphones and everything. We find this guy, and you know, he's 70 or 80 at the time. And got him to play his harmonica, all the women were swooning and everything. It was, it was great because he was the only guy, there was about 20 women in this place, you know, so he's, <laughs> we made his, his fame. So I, I gave, I sent him a copy of the tape later of the show, the interview with Ray DeCapity, you know, uh, Cleveland author, featuring so-and-so on, on harmonica. <laughs> I had this type, all typed up, official label. <laughs> anyway, we had great times there. Well, one of the things that Ray used to say to me that I always stuck because I, I I wrote a lot. I was a theater critic and everything. And as I say, we, we discovered Tom Hanks the summer he was here as a he just had just gotten his actor's card right here in Cleveland. And we gave him the the uh, Critic Circle Award for his his role in uh, Two Gentlemen of Verona. He was great. He said this guy really has something. So literally, we know. Anyway. Um, Ray always used to say that, he said, you know, I think the, the best thing a reviewer can do sometimes is just to quote a little section of the book or quote a poem or something. So, and I'll let you kind of judge for yourself because he might have all these, you know, falutin ideas about everything, but you just want to read a little bit of what the person wrote and see if you like it, see if you respond. So I wanted to start by reading a little a short passage from which I typed up uh, double spaced so I can see it you know <laughs> stumbling over myself from uh, one of Ray's later books Ray you know grew up he was born uh, at um, the corner of literary and professor right it's where a little vacant lot is now just yeah, next to Lolita. just next to Lolita's there he, he took me there once and we stood there and then we went and had a drink you know <laughs> it's too much anyway uh, so but he spent his whole childhood, his youth, and everything around this neighborhood, uh, and uh, in fact wrote a really touching, it's, it's an unpublished novel of his, All Our Farmer Frolics, which is about a family <coughs> living here in Tremont when they put through the Berea Freeway, you know? And because they just, they completely destroyed that neighborhood. They, you know, they needed it, I guess, and all of that. It was after the war and everything. But it just, cut this horrible path right through the neighborhood and really, you know, messed up things. So this is a beautiful novel about the uh, this family of kind of grown children uh, and their mother, uh, which is based on his own situation, I think. And um, they're all getting ready to move on in life, you know, and with their lives and their careers and all that. And she's sort of very reluctant to let go. And it's a, it's a gorgeous touching thing I hope we can get that whole thing published sometime but you know I we did I did an excerpt from it in Cleveland magazine uh, called the freeway cometh that was my title anyway a lovely thing and also Cleveland magazine we talked them into um, publishing an entire novel <laughs> they never did it before and they've never done it since <laughs> But, you know, I gave him this, I brought in Ray's novel, uh, Pat the Lion on the Head. It's a short novel. And I said, this book is tremendous. I think we should publish the whole thing, you know, because it was in typed script at the time. And um, so, oh, well, okay, you know, so the editor took it home, and then the publisher took it home, and everybody was, all these big shots were taking it home to read. And, you know, these guys didn't read, you know, so, you know, so, uh, they come back and I say, well, what do you think? What do you think, you know? Well, I, I can get around to reading it, but now my wife read it. You know, what did she say? Oh, she loved it. She lent it to her friends and, you know, they're passing it around. <laughs> and everybody said that. Well, I didn't uh, read it myself, but my next door neighbor couldn't put it down, you know? So, you know I said, does this tell you something, you know? So anyway, we, so we, we ended up publishing the whole thing in one issue. Well, anyway. So Ray used to talk about the neighborhood here growing up and all the characters. Like he said there was this guy who, uh, his, his one claim to fame was that he was this little short, stumpy guy and he could, he would flip over backwards.
pants and land on his feet and say, yo! <laughs> and everybody would, all the kids would get around and watch him do this. And he told me another time about a, a fight that had taken place. I don't know what street it was, literary or one of these streets, you know. These two men had gotten into this serious fight. And they were both bruisers, you know. And so this big crowd gathered. This must have been back in the 1930s, because Ray was born in 1924. And the crowd followed and said they, they moved down the street, throwing punches and fainting, and occasionally they'd grapple and throw each other to the, you know, the street and things like that. And they went all the way down to the river, he said. You know, everybody <laughs> People were probably taking bets on you know, this whole thing. Anyway, I think this inspired uh, this one character named Figaro in, uh, in a beautiful uh, later novel of his, a short novel, uh, called uh, Go Very Highly Trippingly To and Fro. Anyway, in this scene, the young hero of the novel, a guy named Andy, he's a young guy who kind of hasn't gotten around yet to getting a real job, you know, he's sort of doing a little of this, a little of that, and he, so he's got his, this, uh, this kid uh, writing up bets for a bookie around here. Ray used to come down here and place bets. We would, we'd come by, he'd say, I want to go place a bet with Chooch. Who was Chooch? Chooch was some guy in a wheelchair who ran a little... A literary. Yeah, who ran a little, uh, I don't know, candy store or right? Anyway, Ray going there and please move back. Anyway, <laughs> love the horses. Uh, and that's the other book, the other novel, short novel that's paired with this one. Uh, they're in a book together, and that's called The Stretch Run. And that's, that's an expression from you know, coming into the home stretch of these guys who follow the horses. Mike has a great story, the fact that he's written about uh, being at the track with his dad and all the conversation and all that it went on. Wonderful. He really captured it. So, um, anyway, in this scene, the uh, Andy drops into this local, this little uh, grill, I guess it is, for a, a cup of soup or something, and he ends up being sort of taken with this waitress in Rachel. Wentz, and that's the, the story that spins out from there, and it ends with this lovely scene in, in uh, Lincoln Park up here, as a matter of fact. But anyway, uh, they have their trials. But in this little scene, um, Andy has just come into the come into the place, and Figaro is the owner. This old guy it goes like this, just a page long. First, in the fluorescent light, I saw Figaro. He was coming my way. A girl with yellow hair was sitting in the booth against the back wall. There was a white marble counter with nine red stools. The light in that narrow place was like the death light of an explosion. Figaro stopped within jabbing range of me. His face under white hair cut short was dark, shapeless, like a potato. A door might have been slammed on his nose. I gave him the envelope and told from the bookie, and told him Cappy, the bookie, had sent it. He opened it, counted the money. I saw you fight once, and he said, right here on the hill. I fought Gambola here. I was in the crowd that night. Gambola, Gambola, he said. The name's sweet as candy in his mouth. <laughs> Do you hear that, Rachel? Kid saw me in action. He feasted his eyes on me. There was always somebody coming to try me, he said. He gave you a rough time. He was from Pepper Street. He took you to the river. He held up his fist. I beat him with this. I kept sticking it in his face like an ice cream cone. He didn't like the flavor, believe me. <laughs> Yeah, this it got me thinking, uh, reading this again, about why we watch sports and why we, a lot of us sat glued to the TV during the Winter Olympics and why we can't take our eyes off the calves and things like that. And there's something about athletes and about really good ones and how they, 
they do things with the very same bodies we have, well, not quite the same, but you know, you get the idea. That, that take your breath away and that remind you of the, the potential of human beings. And uh, it's really thrilling. But in Ray's books, it's never the beautiful people. Like you run into F. Scott Fitzgerald, the great Gatsby, and all that, you know, standing around on the, on the lawns with their martinis. Or uh, Hemingway's heroic warriors, none of that sort of thing. Ray always wrote about simple, ordinary, working people, the kind he knew here. And it's their lives that really fascinated him. He was interested in their dreams, not just the kind that, you know, take place in your head at night, but the kind that keep trying to take place in your waking life, you know, the dreams. But he was also drawn to the real. Uh, in the beginning of uh, the coming of Fabrizio, Augustine goes back from America. This is back when a lot of these immigrants used to come over here and they'd work for a while and then they'd go back, you know. Anyway, this guy goes back to the little town up in the uh, Abruzzi Mountains there, which happens to be the town that Ray, Ray's family came from. And, uh, and Augustine, you know, everybody's in awe of him because he's come back from America. This was back in the 20s. And uh, so he, he has, they said he had three different versions of, of his power and glory, you know, in America. But, and then Ray says, no one remarked on the fact that his hands were swollen with work. He, the, these books are full of these little touching moments, these piercing little insights into people. Oh, this guy standing up there carrying on. Anyway, um, he also delighted in words, in the language of people who live and relive their lives, uh, you know, just a little extravagantly, kind of, uh, with people who talk about things with a certain snap and energy. Uh, anyway, he, Ray was always uh, intrigued by that kind of talk. And so, um, let's see, what I wanted to talk about was, was the fact that he, uh, in on all of his books, I think he really does uh, like to kind of zero in on these kinds of people who, who really uh, can really nail an image or say something very uh, piercing about their, their lives who have insights, even though they may not be seem to be very sophisticated people. And uh, in the profile I wrote about Ray for the cleanartsprize.com.org archive, uh, I said, the dreams and the energy of the young are larger than life in Ray's stories, and they infuse life itself with a passionate intensity, an aura of expectation. Uh, that are later forgotten. So anyway, in this novel, Go Very Highly, Trippingly To and Fro, Andy falls in love with his waitress, Rachel. And uh, she's sort of taken with him too, you can tell. It's a touching little relationship. They kid around, and uh, he's kind of teasing her a little bit in the, in the grill. Anyway, she she seems to be taken with him, but she sort of shies away from him, too, as though she's sort of afraid of something. And he can't figure out what's going on with her, so he decides one Sunday morning to confront her on her own turf. He goes out and gets his flowers or whatever he's in, and he heads over there on Sunday morning. And this is right up the street here somewhere, because as they say, it ends where they walk over to Lincoln Park a few days later. Um, he sets out, though, to where she lives. And here's what Ray says. There was a church bell ringing when I stepped into the dazzling light of that Sunday morning. Smoke as white as cotton was billowing from a square stack in the valley. An ore carrier, guided by tugs, was passing under a bridge on its way down the river to the lake. I walked across the street. The gray cat jumped off the porch and scooted into the yard. I went up three steps. The door inside the screen was open. I was just going to knock when I saw Rachel. She was lifting a spoon. 
I was looking through the living room to the dining room. She was sitting at the corner of the table. Her chair was turned my way a little. At the head of the table, with his back to me, was a man with hair cut so short it looked like fur. He was sitting as though he had just been ordered to sit up straight and pay attention. Rachel was feeding him. Suddenly, the spoon was clanging on the floor. Rachel was standing, gaping at me. What are you doing here, she whispered. Bright waves of hair fell past her shoulders. What are you doing, she whispered. She was wearing a blue bathrobe. What is it, Rachel? It's nothing, Pa, she said over her shoulders. Who is it, he said, turning his whole body in the chair to look our way. Who's out there? I started to back away. The porch creaked. Let me see, he cried. Her body went soft. She flipped open the lock on the screen door. Come in, she said. I stood there. Come in, she whispered, glaring, pushing the door open. I stepped into the living room. Her father was looking at me as though my clothes were on fire. <laughs> <laughs> read, read his books then. Uh, you're right. Okay. book. This is my favorite novel of all novels. So I feel lucky to be able to read, to read to you from it. And lucky to have you guys here. And you're lucky to get to hear it. What, <laughs> what is it? <laughs> this is his second novel. It's called The Lost King. Oh, that is a great book. <laughs> Thanks, Frank. <laughs> All along, I had this feeling our troubles would be over if I managed to graduate from Lincoln High School. I was wrong. A summer of trouble was beginning. My father was right when he said it would be a different thing for me out in the world. No one will hold your hand like that teacher, he said. The harmonica days are over. Now you learn to march. He heard drum beats that I never heard. Right after graduation, I went out to look for a job. The newspapers were calling it an interval of economic adjustment, and it seemed that during such intervals, there was no work to be done. Every morning, I shaved and put on a clean shirt and took the bus down to the public square. I had high hope, even though I spent half of each day filling out long applications to prove I was qualified for nothing. Several employers promised to call and give me a chance when openings occurred. Some were disappointed to hear I had no plans for college. A man named P.P. Peterson studied my application for a while and then called me into his office. Let's see now, he said. You want me to tell you how this looks to me? You were probably the oldest boy in your graduating class. You say you were in the lower third of the class, and from your grades, I'd say you were lucky they didn't divide into tenths. <laughs> your last year, however, was very good. Now, you don't look strong enough to do any heavy work, and at the same time, you can't type. I see that one of your hobbies is playing the harmonica. Well, Paul, that's something. I play well. I'm sure you do. At least I hope you do, since it's what you do. <laughs> he burst into laughter. He brought, his hand, <clears throat> he brought his left hand down again and again on the huge polished desk. In a moment, he regained control of himself. He looked at me as though at an intruder. Here's the thing, he said. I can't pay you for playing the harmonica. Now, don't misunderstand me. All this doesn't really matter too much. I wouldn't be afraid to train you up for something. I just don't have a spot for you, but I like your looks, and I'd like to give you some advice. Do you mind? I'd appreciate it. Never sit down at an interview until you're invited to sit down. Smile once when, you're introduced, <clears throat> when you introduce yourself. Don't keep smiling and melting away like that in the chair. It looks like you're falling in love with me. <laughs> Be serious and alert. Pretend there's a bee on the nose of your interviewer. Watch the bee. And now I'd like to wish you good luck. Remember that bee. 
It seemed to me there was a bee in my ear. I heard the same thing everywhere I went. I was getting so discouraged that I started out later in the morning and came home earlier in the afternoon. One morning, as I used to do when cutting school, I went down in the terminal tower to wait for trains. My father had a mysterious first cousin who lived in Vandergrift, Pennsylvania, and so I moved into a crowd of people and looked eager as though expecting him on the next train. There was a deep spreading rumble and then a hot hissing from the level beneath us. The train had arrived. A few minutes later, people were climbing the stairs and riding up the escalator. All at once, I was caught in the midst of laughter and kissing and tears. I smiled welcome to everyone, and most of them smiled and nodded to me. After meeting two more trains, I strolled out to sit on a bench in the public square. I tossed peanuts to the fat, bobbing pigeons. So pleased was I that I bought a cherry pie to please my father. He had developed a taste for sweets since his retirement from work. Late in the afternoon, I went home. An old friend of the family was waiting to see me. His name was Sam Ross. He was sipping wine and puffing a crooked black cigar. He looked me over. He thought it was a wonderful thing that I graduated from high school. Suddenly, he pinched my cheek and slapped me on the knee. Look at him, he said. Look at that brown hair, Carl, and those soft eyes, and that mouth. The picture of his mother, God rest her soul. Isn't it true, Carl? I see the pie, and I know it's another wasted day. <laughs> He's found no job yet, said Sam. Ask him, said my father. He's in front of you. Your father never changes, said Sam. The last time I was here, he put the oven higher and higher. But what are you cooking, I said. He was cooking me, Paul. He was trying to get rid of me. Why didn't he just tell me to go home? Why do you talk about me, said my father. I'm right here. Sam glanced at him and then turned to study me again. He scratched his chin and puffed that cigar. He thought a while and then offered me a temporary job as an assistant on his watermelon wagon. It sounded very good. All I had to do was sit among the watermelons and pass them out to customers when he brought the horse to a stop in a shady place. Why not, he said. You'll be earning some money. I'll give you six dollars a day. Wait then, make it seven. Wait then, I understand you play the harmonica. You can play and let the people know we're there. Make it eight dollars a day. You call that a job, said my father. <laughs> Do you? What do you call it, said Sam. I call it a waste of time. Selling watermelons is a waste of time. I make my living this way. Is eating watermelons a waste of time? How about growing watermelons? Really, Carl, you make no sense. It's no job for him. Don't be foolish, said Sam. The boy is tired from all that studying in school. He should rest his mind a little. Besides, he's earning nothing now. He spends money every day looking for work. It's now he's wasting his time. Would you want your own son to work on a watermelon wagon? I don't have a son. I don't even have a daughter. I mean, if you had a son, what would you do? What would I do, said Sam? I'd buy a cannon just to fire a salute. I'd be the happiest man in the world. <laughs> Listen to me. He'll find work if he keeps looking for it. No one who wants work will be without it for long. Why don't you come out with me? Are you out of your mind? I want company in the day, said Sam. I'm sick of talking to that horse. Besides, Carl, it'll do you good to get out of the house. You live in the past here. You look back and back, and you don't even see what's in front of you. I see what's in front of me. That's why I look back. Now leave me alone. <laughs> in the end, we're all left alone, either to live or die. As for Paul, he can look for another job while he's with me. He can go whenever he pleases. Meanwhile, he'll be earning $8 a day. He can help you with the bills here. I get my pension and the Social Security. It's more than enough. The house is paid for. I don't need any help from anyone. I wish you would come out with me, said Sam. I'll give you nine dollars a day. Paul, Paul, Paul plays the harmonica, it's true, but you talk nonsense that's better than music. <laughs> By the way, how's Nina? They leave when the ship is sinking. And you want them to sink, said Sam. You got an answer for everything. Who sent for you? Do you want me to talk here or look out the windows? And why don't you wash the windows? And look at the plaster falling. Put your own house in order. I pay a woman to put it in order. And I pay a terrible price. 
They argued for another hour. In the end, Sam had his way by insisting it would be a most practical thing for me to take a job and earn some money until I found work more suitable to my education and natural powers. <laughs> Meanwhile, I could rest my mind a little. <laughs> so it was that three days later I went out with Sam Ross for the first time. He had his wagon loaded at the Wholesale Fruit Exchange on Woodland Avenue, and then he came to pick me up on the south side. We traveled around the city. I played the harmonica, and Sam called out that the watermelons were for sale. Eat and drink and wash your face, he said. Children came running and laughing. Their mothers followed them. Everyone was delighted to see us, and it seemed a wonderfully perfect way to make a living. <clears throat> all, that we, <clears throat> all that day we were out in the fresh air and sunlight. Round us was the sweetness of watermelon like cut grass. Deep in the gold of afternoon we sold out, and I lay back in the wagon to watch the sky and listen to the quickening clip-clop of the horse, Tina. She knows when she's going home, said Sam. He was urging her on and laughing at her. He had a golden front tooth. Laughing now, his brown eyes were lost in a web of wrinkles, and his mouth curved toward ears aslant as though in sudden glee. That flashing tooth of gold seemed to tell while keeping the rare secret of laughter. It was good to be with Sam on that watermelon wagon. The job, however, troubled everyone in Lincoln Court. At first, the neighbors gaped at me in utter bewilderment. I didn't understand, and so I gaped back at them. <laughs> Meanwhile, my father was muttering and scratching his head. Nina scolded me on the telephone. Peggy Haley thought it was the worst thing that happened since the war. She came over to tell me about it. You should be ashamed of yourself, she said. What for? I think it's awful, she said, selling watermelons. <laughs> awful? What's so awful about it? What is this? You know what you're talking about? Yes, everyone is saying the same thing. Really? At the same time? I'll tell you what, I'll make a song out of it, and then everybody can sing it together. <laughs> What's awful about selling watermelons? People sell all kinds of things. Tell me one thing better than watermelons. Anything. Anything is better than going through the streets like that in a wagon. And with a horse. Everybody sees you there. <laughs> and we see everybody. Listen a minute, Paul. Think of the other boys we went to school with. Some of those boys are getting ready to go to college. Look at Edmund Hatcher. Is his nose bleeding again? Does it still bleed when he gets excited? Does he still carry two handkerchiefs everywhere? <laughs> Edmund works for the Midwestern National Bank. They're training him. They're training him for an important position in the, in the credit department. And he goes to business school at night. He's ambitious. So am I. Are you? Of course I am. I'd like to kiss your lower lip. <laughs> On both sides of that line. It looks like it was kissed up into two ripe little portions. And both delicious. It's a beautiful mouth, Peggy. Now, about this job. I think it's a good job for the summer. And what will you do this winter? Save my strength for next summer. <laughs> you just don't understand. You're getting off on the wrong foot. You'll never live this down, Paul. Everyone is laughing at you. Is this true? Every word of it. Believe me. Don't you know Sam Ross has been doing this for years and years? He makes so much money in the summer, he doesn't lift a finger all winter. He's got this big open fireplace at home. He burns these logs and warms his feet and looks for faces in that fire while the wind blows and the snow piles up. Is that all he does? Now he's got something else to do. He can laugh. He can laugh at all the people who laugh at him during the summer. I'm going to tell him to look for their faces in the fire. You'll be on the list. It's a job for little boys and old men. You're just starting out in life. What'll happen when you go looking for a job and tell them you've been selling watermelons from a wagon in the street? Well, what's your ambition in life? I want a wagon of my own. <laughs> Stop it, Paul. And a white horse with plumes as black as your hair. I don't even know why I'm talking to you. I know why. You came over here to hear the secret. Secret, she said, alerted. What secret? Come closer. I'll whisper it. Look at this. 
Do you know your ear is like a little hidden wing, so pretty and still in your hair, with your hair waving and curving around it? Now there's another secret. Do you know what the first one is? I'd like to whisper secrets in your ear. And the second one, I love you. Oh, Paul, she said, blushing. I wish I had a plum. A plum? I'm teasing. Really, Peggy, I love you with all my heart. I used to spend whole days in school watching your hair and your ear and the curve of your neck. It was enough for me. Why, I thought there was nothing more in the world. And then guess what? Remember that day a long time ago when I fell out of my desk and cut my head? <laughs> Miss Goldberg thought I fainted? I think I remember. Yes, Paul, I do remember. I was watching you that day. I guess your leg was itching. <laughs> you reached down to scratch it and your dress came up. I saw your leg above the knee. It was so soft and white and beautiful that tears came in my eyes. What more could I ask? I was just getting over it and you started scratching again. You were squirming and scratching and your dress was coming up higher and higher and I was leaning forward there and my heart popped in my mouth. All at once I saw the curve of your bottom. I couldn't catch my breath. It looked like a honeydew melon at first. And then the breast of a swan. And then like a big pearl. And I could only see the beginning of it. And it looked like there was no end to it. I was leaning and leaning and I fell forward on my head. Oh, she said, blushing hotly. Oh. What a reward for all my watching. I spent the rest of the year in, <laughs> I spent the rest of the year in that ancient history class waiting for you to scratch your leg again. <laughs> I mean it. I missed 2000 years of history. <laughs> and I'm still waiting. Do it before you go home. <laughs> You must be crazy, Paul. I never heard such things. I want to marry you as soon as possible. I can't stand it any longer. And then I'll be in a position to scratch your leg. <laughs> really, Peggy, I love everything about you. I always did. I always will. You shouldn't be saying these things. You really shouldn't. Why shouldn't I? It's how I feel about you. Don't you hear me playing the harmonica at night? Sometimes I'm playing it just for you. And I make up songs for you, too. It's the truth. How about if I come over and sit on your porch later? We'll make some plans. I'll bring a surprise for you. A surprise? What is it? A watermelon. <laughs> watermelon? As red as your lips, and maybe as sweet. I doubt it. But I'll find out later. <laughs> Keep your old watermelon. Don't you like watermelon? You're hopeless, Paul. You really and truly are. She left me there on the porch. In the following days, I found out that she was right about the neighbors. They whispered and laughed at, <clears throat> laughed at me when I walked through the alley. I used to whistle or play the harmonica, and everyone would wave and say hello. Now it was different. It's the watermelon boy, one would say. <laughs> say, Paul, does that horse eat watermelon? You ever look at that horse in the eye, Paul? Tell me something, said the barber, Regus. Just one thing. How can I tell if a watermelon is sweet? Tap it, I said. Tap it on the left side. The left side? Which is the left side? It's the side in your left hand. Tap it. <laughs> Tap it and listen close. And then, cut it open and taste it. <laughs> Regis laughed and laughed. Along with everyone, he was laughing when that joke was forgotten. I started to slip out of the house like a thief and walk over to Scranton Avenue to meet Sam Ross. Laughter in the alley went a little hard with mockery and seemed to follow me everywhere. It followed my father closer. He was brooding until he turned completely against that job. Just about then, I surprised him by going downtown to pay the semi-annual tax on the house. It came to $90. He thought it over and held it against me, <laughs> as though I had moved to undermine his remaining power and authority. He sat on the porch and blew a cloud of pipe smoke when he saw me coming from work with a watermelon lifted like a prize in the palm of my hand. Day after day, I brought watermelon home. I brought quarters and halves, and then for Sunday, I brought a whole one. The refrigerator was loaded. 
I tried to eat as much as I was bringing. I would, <clears throat> I would have a big smiling cut of it for supper. After cleaning the kitchen, I played the harmonica. Music gave me a taste for more melon. I ate another piece, and, <clears throat> and it washed me so fresh and clean inside that I played the harmonica again. Before going to bed, I ate another piece of melon. Around three in the morning, I woke to eat again. <laughs> it was like a spell on me. My shirts and trousers and under underclothes were stained with juice. I found seeds in my pockets and shoes. It seemed that whenever I went around, whenever I turned around, my father was watching me spit seeds idly into the garbage pail in front of my chair. There were times in the evening when the only sound was the tick of seeds against the sides of that metal pail. Toward the end, I think my father was coming awake at three in the morning to stare in the dark and listen to the dry tick of seeds. My talk failed to help the situation. This piece isn't bad, I would say. It's better than the one I had yesterday. Still, the one I had Monday was the best of all. I wish I could find another melon like that. I was eating and wondering what was missing. I was eating and wondering and eating and wondering. And then it was gone, and I knew what was missing. The piece was perfect, and it was the rest of the melon that was missing. Have we got time for some music before supper? It'll do you good. My father turned sullen. He didn't talk much, and despite me, he wouldn't eat any melon. He would open the refrigerator and stand there with eyes blazing and that pipe aiming straight from his mouth. One afternoon, I came into the yard with half a melon held high in my hand, he was sitting in the porch on the rocker, uh, sitting on the rocker on the porch. He was holding the sides of that chair as though to keep it from falling apart. His knuckles bulged into white marbles. What's that? He said, though he could see it plain. Half a melon. It's a beauty, Pa. We don't have enough yet? The next afternoon I came home with another half. He was waiting for me in the kitchen. I started talking to cheer him after his lonely day. I wanted to tease him just to hear his quick, sour laughter. <clears throat> Sam says I'm doing fine, I said. He may raise my salary. One thing's sure, he'll be giving me a whole watermelon every night. <laughs> he says he'll stay ahead of us if it's the last thing he ever does. Not a half or a quarter, Pa. It'll be one whole one every day. But I don't want you to worry. I got it all figured out. I'll take a day off work every week to eat and catch up with him. I opened the refrigerator. Watermelon bulged from every shelf. You should buy another refrigerator, I said. Now let's eat a piece of melon before putting this piece in. I'll take a half out to make room for this half, but I see you didn't eat any today. What a naughty boy you are. Do you know a strange thing is happening to me? It seems like all I think about is watermelon. <laughs> it's all I think about, he said softly. Do you know what happened to me <clears throat> about three in the morning? And it's all I think about, he was saying even more softly. I was eating this piece of melon, and when I finished, the, finished it, the bottom of the pail was black with seeds. Now listen to this. A watermelon grows from one seed. Isn't that right? But there'll be a hundred seeds in the watermelon that grew from one seed. This means each watermelon has enough seeds to give a hundred watermelons. And these watermelons have enough seeds for thousands and thousands, and then millions and millions. What does this mean? I was thinking about it. I was thinking, maybe God wanted to make sure there'd be enough watermelons so that everyone, everywhere, would have enough of them till the end of the world. <laughs> plant all those wasted seeds and in a few years we'd have watermelons piled in the whole mountain ranges. Why, it's just like God was planning a big feast where everyone sits and eats watermelon. Sam says there's no end to it. Sam is wrong, cried my father. Sam is wrong. There'll be an end to it. I'm making an end right now. He tore open the refrigerator. He pounced on those melons and started throwing them out the window and door. Melons went flying through the air to split open on the porch and in the yard. Neighbors gathered. Peggy was there. My father threw out every piece but the one on the table. I picked it up. I was so excited that I threw it out the window <laughs> to join him in the uproar. So much for Sam, he cried, and so much for God's plans again. 
It's the end of the watermelon. You hear? I'm sick of this job. Everyone's laughing at you. You're making a jackass out of yourself. And me too. Maybe we should talk this over. Why did I work all these years? So you could sell watermelons from a wagon? Is that it? Wake up. You live in a country where you can be anything you want. Look what the hell you're doing. You're going backward full speed. The next thing I know, you'll be sailing back to the old country to herd sheep. Get out and clean up that mess out there. I swept up those broken melons and threw several pails of water to keep flies away. Afterward, I sat on the porch step. My father stormed around the house until dark. And then he came out to rock his fury away in the chair at the other end of the porch. There was the red glow of steel mill fire in the sky. Smokestacks seemed to be bobbing like black masts out of a midnight harbor. Sudden white smoke billowed from a distant stack and for an instant froze in a kind of fairyland tower in the dark. Now I heard the rhythmic creak of the rocking chair. I played the harmonica with it. My father rocked a little faster to free the creak of the chair from my, from my song. I played faster. <laughs> Suddenly he was rocking so fast that I stopped playing. I burst into laughter. His hair was white as the smoke and he was bowing and rearing in that chair as though astride some runaway horse in the night. Thing. This is just from the beginning of a story I wrote, the one Dennis mentioned. Sitting pretty. It's a picture of me and my father. I'm just going to read the uh, opening couple pages. It's a bright morning in August. I'm riding with my father to the track. We're rolling down Pearl in traffic, bumper to bumper, every surface a glare. Outside it's a big hot kaleidoscope. Strip mall on shopping center, shoe store on auto parts on fast food, blinding in the heat, the deepest wilds of the suburbs, and everybody's out. It's too much. I search myself for cigarettes, headache and all. Doesn't anybody work in this town? Where are they all going? Well, they're relentless shoppers here, he says. <laughs> The match flames invisible, just a sizzle at the cigarette end, adding more heat to the day. I'm laughing. One franchise collapses into another. We get stuck at a light. Car holding up okay, he asks. Yeah. Isn't it a lot of trouble to keep a car up there? Yeah, it's a pain in the ass. Hmm. I was up there without it, but I gotta have a car. I've always had a car. Without it, I just... I mean, you got to be able to get out, otherwise you're sunk. It raises you up, having a car. Gives you some control. He nods. I feel like I've been talking for five minutes. I don't know. When I don't, when I don't have a car, I'm at a loss. It's part of my identity. I mean, I think of myself as a, as a, uh, as a motorist. <laughs> exactly. <coughs> Another light. They've moved to Parma Heights, he and my mother. My Buick's back at their building, fresh from a 500-mile haul, with its busted grill and never-washed flanks, its no-back seat and New York plates. It's an insult to the other cars in the lot. Yesterday, I was sailing through traffic, and a van roared up beside me at a red light. The guy leaned over. Hey, we don't drive like that here. <laughs> the words sounded strange to me. We and here. Now I'm hungover from a late night on the south side. I slept at Al's and got up early to catch my dad. His impal is old too, but clean. The tidy black interior is everywhere hot to touch. I feel dishonest sitting in it, wondering if, the, <coughs> wondering if he can sleep off me. By the bank sign, it's 87 degrees at 1213. You see your friends last night? Yeah, I was at the lit bunch of people there. We hit the freeway ramp at a crawl. He gets it up to 55 and merges left, holding his lane. Post time's an hour away and we've been out in the heat for an hour already. Two supermarkets, a bakery, and a newspaper stand for the form. His days are long and he's restless. 
He gets up in the dark before the birds. By 6 a.m., dinner and a salad are ready in the fridge. My mother gets up. He serves her half a grapefruit and coffee and toast. She goes off to work. By 8 o'clock, he's done with the paper, and there's nothing to stand between him and time. He doesn't care to be distracted. He's taking time on the chin. His life seems to be mostly about satisfying a duty toward time, keeping an eye on it, for one thing, monitoring its passage. He occupies himself with bare, well-worn activities which don't interfere much with that. He's concerned with trying to satisfy certain necessities, cooking or eating or errands with care and a kind of dogged finesse. He pats his pockets for keys and glasses before leaving the apartment. He handles produce on his shopping rounds or money at the counter. His movements have acquired the easy weight of right and memory. He handles the world the way you'd play with an old dog, rough, familiar, preoccupied. Going to the track is a way for me to take part in his routine. The track is mostly about sitting around. It's a place to go. You find your bench and get to work dealing with time. You figure it down to fifths of seconds and then wait 25 minutes for the race to go off. For a student of time, like my father, it's perfect. Let me have one puff of that, Mike. I give him my cigarette. He takes a hit and hands it back. I take a last burnt drag and flick it into the hot wind. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, this is because now he's, yeah. <laughs> 